Hey everyone, happy Friday. It's Jessica Dupuy, and uh, I am hoping that you uh, will enjoy the conversation I'm about to have here um, over the next few minutes. Uh, I'm gonna be joined by Storm Cellar Wine, uh, and here they are. I'm gonna let them in real quick, one second. Excellent, all right, here we go. They are joining us here soon. Coming into the chat. Good morning. Yay. Good morning. Wow, I love the background. You've got the winery and everything like on display. That's it. Yes, <laughs> it's also the place right now. So, yeah, I was gonna say I I um I should almost apologize to you for trying to set something up like while you guys are in the thick of harvest. Um, it worked out. <laughs> To, um, a press load, our final press load of Riesling for the season after we finish the live. <laughs> oh, okay. We've got great queued up. Uh, we just picked the last of them. Um, so we're really, uh, I don't even think we've let it sink in that harvest for us is all over. Over. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You guys look remarkably alive and, and well and awake um, for all Good. of it. <laughs> a drink. Coffee. We both have coffee. <laughs> Lots of coffee. I actually have a quick question about that because, you know, you are located in a lot of uh, a much cooler region than what I'm used to, like in Texas. Um, so are you guys having to harvest at night or can you just harvest during the day or is it cool enough that that doesn't really make a difference or? I mean, it's all dependent upon the season. I mean, our, our season is, it is cooler, but it's also really, it's a compact growing season. So we do get, you know, heat over the summer, like you all do. We definitely tapped into 100s, even not so much, but high 90s back in like August, even parts of September. And it's been kind of a balmy um, harvest season. Really, it's about 75 uh, you know, degrees for picking. So we're able to pick during the day. We try to pick in the morning. Um, we brought in grapes last night. Okay. So we're required to do a night harvest, um, but we like to keep the grapes cool. We keep them on dry ice um, and then they're ready to press. So okay. it's been okay. moderate. Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, I should probably, let me just like pause before we jump into everything. Yes. Like, I just want to make sure we introduce you guys correctly. So we've got Jamie Henderson and Steve Steese of the Storm Cellar Wine. Uh, winery based in the West Elks ABA of Colorado. So that's Peonia, Hotchkiss, those little small towns that hopefully some of you have heard of. Um, it's on the Western Slopes. Tell me a little bit about um, where you are, the region itself, and then I kind of want to talk about why in the world you're doing it. So tell me where, the where first, and then the, the what and how. We'll get there. Sure. So <clears throat> we're on the Western side of Colorado. There's not really per se, much grape growing potential on the front range, unless we're talking about things like old hardies and hybrids. Um, the front range is um, more extreme winters, more extreme summers, um, certainly more snowfall and colder in the winter. So pretty much all of the grape growing in Colorado happens on the western slope. Mm -hmm. Most of that is centered around the area called the Grand Valley, which is around the towns of Palisade um, near Grand Junction. Grand Junction is four hours basically straight line due west from Denver. Um, so that's not where we are. We are in the second AVA of Colorado, just like you said, the West Elks. So um, for people that know Colorado, you would head three hours west from Denver to Glenwood Springs and go an hour south. So we're kind of an hour, a little over an hour southeast of the Palisade region, and it is distinctly different. They are high altitude their vineyards are at about 4500 feet but we're almost at 6000 feet here so certainly us the vineyards within 10 miles of here are the highest elevation in the entire northern hemisphere by a gigantic margin for sure yeah. it's fringe grape growing sure. we'll have to show you uh, yeah, if our wi-fi allows us to sneak out of the building at some point just to show you like the landscaping because basically like we are at the edge of where the mountain Canyon lands begin. So it's a very diverse landscape. Uh, you, you can see snow capped peaks and you can see basically desert lands off to the west. And we're right there. Kind of like right on that dividing line. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's something, you know, just to, for frame of reference for everyone, like, you know, front range, when we talk front range, we are talking Denver, Boulder, you know, the, the, the kind of bigger cities, um, that side of, of Colorado. And then we get to 
you know, the beautiful mountains, the Rocky Mountains, that's where all the ski towns are. And so when we re refer to the Western Slope, that's where we're talking about, we're, we're starting to depart from the ski towns and it, it actually, you know, is the other side. Yes. Um, and I love that you referenced kind of that desert feel because in a lot of ways where you guys are, it has the imagery that you might expect in parts of like Utah as it starts to fade into Utah, right? So, um, well, I'd love to know from you, uh, you guys come from uh, the wine industry in a different way. You guys were both wine professionals working in the restaurant industry. So kind of tell me about, you know, what that life was like and more importantly, how you transitioned uh, to deciding to make great, uh, to make wine grow grapes. Yeah, I, I'd say we're still transitioning. Uh, okay. I, so, you know, I'll definitely talk about where we, where we came from with our pasts, but we still continue that hospitality uh, mindset. I think it's ingrained within you, you know, um, once you're in the hospitality industry, it's, it's forever in your heart. Um, there's no way to explain that other than to, to do it. Um, but we love entertaining guests. We love that moment where a guest, you know, enjoys a bottle of wine that you talk about together, uh, discuss, or they're trying something new. And it's, it's a connection that, you know, we kind of missed right when we jumped out here and began farming. So we were sommeliers and beverage professionals in Denver, like you said, for 20 years each. Um, and really, you know, our, the extent of our farming uh, repertoire was basically we converted our Denver City plot to a garden. We had about like 45 to 50 tomato plants. It was a completely edible garden, um, zero scape. And that's what we did. And we thought we could just, not, we didn't think, it wasn't something foolish, but we honestly thought, you know, if we can dial in this backyard, it's just the scalability to a vineyard. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just learning those ropes, um, I'm oversimplifying it. And perhaps we did. And I think that sometimes if you oversimplify it and kind of chase a dream at first, it's good to not know what awaits you in its full force. Right. So we did, uh, we moved out here to this vineyard. It was an existing, our planted vineyard um, in, in March of 2017. And it was planted to all white wine varieties. And we jumped in and the first day we were out here, we learned and started to prune the vines. And we didn't have a winery here yet. That would be a year forward in 2018. But, you know, we tapped into resources around the valley, um, actually tapped into online resources too for learning how to prune um actually a gentleman out in texas does a wonderful job uh westover viticulture has fritz. Yes. yeah shout out to fritz we love fritz that's awesome yeah. he's, he's been an, an invaluable resource to us um as beginners uh, and, and by no means are we pros now i think there's always something to learn but yeah. for us farming is is we love that connection of seeing where the wine starts, but we also really want to hold on to like, you know, that moment where a finished bottle goes into a guest's hands. So we love, you know, operating our tasting room now and staying, you know, relevant in restaurants. Well, and I love that that, that transition, um, it's not like from one to the other that they really are in sync. Um, but I love that y'all have that understanding. You know what it takes to get wines on a menu in a restaurant and why it's important. Um, to to be kind of like pounding the pavement if you will to make sure that that um you know wine buyers restaurant you know sommeliers whatever you want to you know title them as are are aware of the work that's being done and i think that's super important for being uh in the in the shoes that you guys are in now so uh, so you became great growers and and learning on the fly thank goodness for fritz yay yeah um <laughs> and I, just shout out there. So it's, it's Fritz Westover and I believe it's uh, Westover Vineyards. I think if you're uh, looking to follow him, but definitely. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, viticulture. It's like his uh, virtual viticulture Academy is what he has online. Yes. 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 Super helpful. Um, we've watched so many tutorials. So yeah. Yeah. He's great. Um, so, so, so let's talk a little bit about this. Um, I'm going to jump like straight into, I want to talk about your vineyard. We, we, we've already mentioned that it's at like this 6,000 elevate 6,000 foot elevation, which as you said, that's high. That's the highest in the Northern hemisphere. I mean, we talk about high elevation sites in other parts of the world, but usually when we're talking at that level, that's, that's the Andes mountains, right? Like down in, in the Southern hemisphere. Um, so what are you growing? What can you grow at that elevation? Sure, that's a good question. Yeah. What we're growing currently, we're focusing on Riesling, uh, 
Um, that's the core of our project here is Riesling for sure. Um, but Chardonnay, a uh, big block of Pinot Noir, which is surprising if you'd have asked me personally if I thought Pinot Noir would find a home in Colorado five years ago, I would say no way. And then if you would double ask me if, if it would find a home at 6,000 feet in the West Elks, I would say absolutely no way. But it is undeniable that Pinot Noir has found a home in this valley. And mm -hmm. we definitely want a piece of that pie for sure. So we planted a full acre of Pinot Noir this spring. Mm -hmm. um, when we moved here, the vineyard had Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Gris planted too. Unfortunately, the terrible root louse phylloxera is ravaging both of those portions of the vineyard. So they are due for replanting. Yes. Um, but people ask all the time why we fixate on white wines. And certainly it's because that's primarily what we love to drink. Right. Yeah. Um, but in general, one of the side effects of growing at 6,000 feet is the, the crazy diurnal shift here so it doesn't matter how hot it gets during the day it's going to get cool at night if you're at 6,000 feet mm -hmm. which preserves natural acidity in wines and we tend to think and a lot of people tend to think that if you're going to have a higher acid profile wine people tend to like that more in a white wine profile than they do in a red wine. Certainly there are things like Pinot Noir that people like a higher acid Pinot Noir but you know, people don't usually gravitate towards the super high acid Merlots or Cabernet Sauvignons or those kinds of things. So mm -hmm. it seems like the right fit for this valley to us, the soil type, the um, aspect of the vineyard, everything seems really suited to growing white wine grapes here. And, and with respect to like which what wine varieties to actually plant, like I mentioned before, you have a, a really compact growing season. So you have to plant grapes that are more cold hardy um, that require a shorter time to ripen uh, because you have those late or those late spring frosts, those early fall frosts that you're just like basically biting your nails to make sure that you either don't kill buds in the spring or you you don't have to bring in your fruit too early in in the fall. So it's and, and riesling does take a longer time to ripen. However, um, it it can definitely um, it can sustain colder temperatures better than a lot of other grapes that you know, might need that length of time to ripen. So for us, we're, we're definitely going to be uh, continuing to replant Riesling, uh, looking forward to doing even, you know, sparkling versions of Riesling. It's near and dear to our heart and it's really expressing itself beautifully here. Yeah. yeah. Riesling is a nail biter here. This is the first year that we've been here that our Riesling harvest hasn't been built around in 26 a, a, degree a terrible weather. frost event. Yeah. So we were harvesting and 65 degrees yesterday it was glorious for racing harvest yes. we've had this love-hate relationship because there'll be days where we're just like shoveling grapes into the press and it's snowing on you yeah like, what are we doing it's the worst decision no. ever and we don't have hot water at our winery and so when you have to wash equipment or whatever yes we sanitize it but we're using cold spring water and so your hands are about the color of steve's shirt <laughs> so that's, that's that's talked about you know some uh some of the repercussions you know the physical repercussions that you have yep. of it um but i do love that you're talking about how you can get pinot noir to ripen and you can get riesling to ripen at that elevation of six thousand feet yes. i think it's got to be because of the latitude that you're at right so you're still at the lower latitude plus the higher elevation so that solar radiation is working in your favor it works in our favor just yeah. that high UV intensity, um, which can be a blessing and a curse because, you know, you're at that, you have that UV intensity and it can really thicken the grape skins. And if you think about, say, making a red wine, you need to have skin contact with the clear juice to give it color, tannins, complexity. Right. But at the same time, you can also impart bitterness because of those thicker skins. So it's, it's a delicate balancing act um, for our style of wine that we want to make going forward. You know, we really love using those red grapes like Pinot Noir or Chamberson or St. Vincent, those are two hybrids that we're working with. Um, because you don't have to worry about that, any type of um, bitterness coming in because of that UV exposure, because of that limited skin contact, you're just getting that kiss of color um, right. from the skins. Right, I love it. Well, so let's talk about that. So I have your Riesling in my glass really quick. I'm just gonna okay. let join you. <laughs> yeah, this will be backwards, I think, on the screen, but you'll get the feel, right? This is a lovely, I love y'all's um, design uh, on your bottles. Can you, uh, well, no, let's not talk about design. Let's talk about the wine first. So this is what is so cool is, I feel like this Riesling, 
it's a dry Riesling and um, it, it kind of balances between what you might expect from Alsace because of the ripeness that it's able to get, but then it's super delicate also like you might get from Germany. So um, is this a something you're pushing towards or kind of talk about this wine and how y'all y'all went about deciding to do dry and then also in this style? Riesling is so interesting. Like Jamie said, it, it takes so long for Riesling to ripen. And mm -hmm. what that means is it has inherently naturally super high acidity. Magnify that by the fact that you're at 6,000 feet. So it takes a long time for the acid levels to drop um, to a point where you could make a wine that's drinkable. Yeah. Most of the time, it, it would have to be super sweet to balance out that sort of high acidity. But to make a drier style of wine here, you have to get the grapes riper than you would make a uh, drier style in Germany. So it's going to be more full bodied. It's going to be richer in profile. It's, it's not going to be 12% alcohol. It's going to be 13% alcohol. And it's going to have the weight to carry that. But you're right. There's a delicacy here, too. Something yeah. happens at 6,000 feet. <laughs> that is compelling. It's across every grape we've grown from Chardonnay to Pinot Gris to everything as really compelling floral, light, really- A lot of finesse. Finesse, yeah. delicate aromas. And we're also at a unique spot here growing Riesling. Um, and it's kind of, it, it makes Colorado its own Riesling style. Because if you think about so many other regions in the world where Riesling is grown, you're usually around a body of water. You know, think about Finger Lakes, um, you know, think about parts of Germany, and, and we are in an alpine desert. Uh, you talk about, like, one of the first questions that Steve and I asked when we were looking at this property is, like, you know, do you dry farm out here? And we kind of got laughed at because, you know, you, for, you know, you dry farm, a lot of, you know, growers, as you know, dry farm to not overwater. You really want the vines to struggle um, to produce their character. Our vines struggle anyway. Um, our ground is so porous. We actually have a, a sample to show you what the actual soil or lack of it looks like. Um, so we have to irrigate. If we don't irrigate, our vines die. Um, so in a drought year, it's, 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 it, that's also a nail biter. Um, even though Colorado is showing great promise uh, because of its climate to grow grapes, the one thing that we are concerned, one of the things that we're concerned about is water availability for the long term, especially the patterns that we've seen recently. Okay, so and talk about that. So where is your water coming from? And is it the slopes? Is it some underground water table? Like, where are you on water? Where, where's that coming from? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we are about 500 feet above the valley floor, um, and we have very porous soil. So we do not have a water table from which we're drawing. We are completely reliant in our irrigation, uh, in our irrigation season or growing season on uh, water that is uh, snowmelt. So we are you know, over the winter, you know, snowfalls in the high country. For us, it collects in the Paonia Reservoir. And it's a reservoir that runs about 37 miles at about a 5% grade and feeds many of the farms here in the valley. And we had enough water this past year forecasted to carry us through late September. Um, it was cut off in mid-August. And this is because there was no rainfall. Uh, it was super hot. It was very windy. And so the, the, the actual ground absorbed a lot of what was in the Paone Reservoir um, through absor absorption, evaporation. And so we you know, were cut off about a month early. Uh, and we had just planted new vines and we still had to ripen. It was right when Verizon was just kicking in, right just beginning. Um, we do have a backup spring uh, that it has saved us nowhere near the amount of irrigation water that we get during the season, but it's enough for us to be able to keep the vines alive. We share it with two other um, neighbors, and so we're all very vigilant with how much we take. It requires communication. Um, it's, it's a balancing act. Wow. So I would think, so, you know, also to put in perspective, like where you are in the West Elks, but then also in the Grand Valley, like these are regions that are historically known for their fruit production. So peaches and cherries and things like that. Um, so obviously grapes kind of fit in. Um, so that water uh, issue, um, that kind of leads me to, you know, the hot topic now, which is clearly you guys might be seeing the effects of climate change in ways that other people aren't in different growing regions, or maybe everybody is, but, you know, because of that. Um, that yeah, that's a heavy topic. I, I, you probably have something to say too, Steve, but I'll mention it from this year's perspective. 
uh, we usually don't have to add bird netting to our Riesling grapes. The acid level is just kind of unappealing to birds. We don't see a lot of bird pressure this time of year. Um, we had an early fall frost event back in the first week of September that didn't affect us. So we didn't dip down. We only went to a 37 degrees, no harm. But in the high country, we think Aspen, all of those ski towns you mentioned that are still coming off of summer, saw you know a 90 degree day dipped down to below freezing. And what it did, we, we, when we're seeing the effects of it, a lot of the bugs were killed off. And so that's a primary source of a lot of birds, robins. Wow. And so if their food source is frozen off, killed up in that high country, they're forced to go elsewhere to find food. And so we've seen a lot of robins. We had bird pressure. Uh, they'd say that was the, aside from drought, bird pressure was the biggest uh, challenge this harvest. Uh, we had a neighbor who um, fired off just a pallet gun to make noise. He would come out three times a day. We had to install a bird noise maker. It was too late in the season for us to put bird netting on because it takes multiple weeks. Um, but going forward, if we see a fall frost event happen in the high country, I think we'll immediately go out and put bird netting on because we'll, you know, now we know that birds will eat the Riesling grapes if they're forced to. Yeah, that that's interesting. Yeah, so it's it's a moving target, and some of these indicators are teaching you for the next season, but kind of sometimes you're high and dry for the, <laughs> the current yeah. season. Yeah. Well, um, so I want to move to another like interesting topic because I in in researching this book uh, that I just put out um, on which I guess I should mention the wines of Southwest USA, uh, which includes Texas, New Mexico, um, Arizona, and Colorado. Um, one of the things that I was interesting, interested to discover was this issue of phylloxera, right? And that um, in the past few years, that has been discovered in a number of vineyards um, throughout the state. And it's not unusual, right, to see phylloxera pop up in places um, in California. It's happened. And I think in Washington, uh, it's happening a little bit too. Um, but, you know, by and large, most people think that, oh, phylloxera has been taken care of. We've We've gotten rid of it. We put things on rootstocks and it's all good and everything, but that's not necessarily the case in Colorado. So why are we seeing phylloxera pop up? Um, I'm leading you because you should answer it, not me. But I think that, I think it would be interesting. I, when I heard your vineyard had some of it, I was like, oh my gosh, how? I mean, that's, yeah. that's the thing to realize is that it is, it is there and there's no getting rid of it. <laughs> um, people think it's gone. It's just not attacking your vines, but once it's there, it's there. Um, Colorado thought it was one of the few places in the world like, um, you know, Chile's um, grape growing regions where it's, you know, the Atlanta, Pacific Ocean on one side, Atacama Desert on the other, and these super isolated regions have thought they were, uh, you know, immune to it. Yeah. And a lot of those places like in Chile work really hard to quarantine to make sure that things don't make it in. In Colorado, because of its extreme climate, the state mm -hmm. thought that it was immune. Um, so the whole state is planted on ungrafted vines. It's all, so it's wide the whole state is, is own rooting. Yeah, it's amazing. And, you know, we're shopping for vines now. Like Amy was saying, we're planting new vines every year. And I'm amazed still that we go on, you know, major wine um, nurseries websites in California and Washington, and you look at what's available for purchase and still so many own rooted vines are being yeah. created I mean, and purchased. Maybe they're there for grafting purposes, but people are still planting on rooted vines, even in our state, thinking that they're unsusceptible, like, you know, because um, it's spread by people for the most part, you know, uh, mud on your feet. So like for us, you know, when it rains and it's muddy out in the vineyard, we don't take our tractor and run it through and kick the mud on the tires. Uh, we don't allow people to walk through the vineyard. You know, honestly, we thought it was going to move at a much slower pace, but because back to climate change, back to the extremes of temperature, if we don't have a dormant season over the winter, I mean, it, the, the, the bugs don't go dormant and they can yeah. spread. So it's. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It's so bittersweet. But the, we're the future forward. is grafted. We're yeah. gonna, the future is. We're going to have a I show. love it. I, I see a mag like a magazine story and that's the headline. <laughs> There are certain, certainly issues with grafted vines, but you know, if you the graft line is particularly susceptible to yes. cold right. for many many years. But the theory, just like you know, 
when California pl planted against grafting in the 60s, they planted on the AXR1 rootstock that everybody thought was immune to phylloxera, but it actually had some, um, you know, vinifera parentage. And so California back in the 90s basically had to be replanted. It was like, I don't know, $3 billion <clears throat> expense. But mm -hmm. the thought is, you know, now that there's all this new development with different rootstocks, a lot of clonal development that when it comes back, it comes back stronger than ever. I mean, that's suddenly some, something we did here. We got to choose rootstock that's tailor-made to grow in high alkaline soils mm -hmm. um, and then graft the kind of vines you want on top of that. So conceptually, the vineyard will be better than ever when it comes back around. Right. right. Yeah. How do you counteract it, that, that grafting line? So can you, is it mulch that you can use to help or what are some ways that y'all can help combat that potential for the freeze? Blow on it, add some heat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> basically, well, we have a, a couple machines that do that. Uh, okay. We have wind machines that yeah. uh, basically do exactly what you're saying. Um, you know, they'll, a lot of times people will visit our vineyard and think that we have these, you know, energy uh, or electricity generator fans. They're actually electric fans that pull warm air, you know, from about 130 feet above and then pull, or excuse me, bring that warm air down to the base of the plants. Yeah. So that, um, if it's windy and cold, you don't need to run the fans. So we do, what we do is um, we mound the actual plants. So we'll take the tractor and plow up a little mound along each side of the plant, mound it to cover the actual, um, you know, graft line, put straw on it. Uh, those are measures that we can take. Like right now we have, we're taking row tubes down. Um, you don't want to leave them on when it's cold. So everything is so time sensitive. Got it. Okay. There we go is is here in Colorado in season one um, if you were in California you know you'd be planting new vines in March and so by the time yes. first frost even if there was such a thing in California came around your vines would have been in the ground a long time where well, we have to wait to plant until after the danger of that so we don't get to plant until June so that first year your, May, plant, your plants have only been in the ground a few months and so yeah. we we took every precautionary measurement and we yeah. baby in this year. I was going to say, I was going to show you. We talked about soil. So this is what our soil looks like. Um, it's really chalky. It's about 8.1, 8.2 pH. And if you think about planting a new vine, if you can see a new vine, there we are, a new vine into that, they do not take well. It's great. This poor soil is great for established vines. Um, thrives they you know really push down to extract nutrients but we have to bring in compost we have to amend the soil to actually yeah. make our soil plantable for new vines so yeah. it's, a, it's a struggle early on so i remember talking to you guys at first um when i first interviewed y'all about you know how you're combating phylloxera and as you said steve like you can't get rid of it right but Y'all are, y'all still have, I mean, you have, is it some of the Sauvignon Blanc that has the phylloxera, but it's, it's still producing. So you're going to try to hold on to it as long as you can. And then slowly you're replanting with, or what, I don't know. Sorry. What's your plan? Well, I roll my eyes because we did say that um, it, it's moving faster than we would like uh, because, you know, we're, we can only um, make an educated guess, but honestly, because of the lack of dormancy uh, period, um, or just, you know, the population has reached that critical mass where it just is exponential. So we're replanting faster. We had kind of said when we were talking with you, we'd go about 1,000 uh, plants a year, do it over the course of like 15 years. But we're seeing that we need to make large moves. Um, so like our 2019 vintage of both Pinot Gris and Sauvignon Blanc, those are the last vintages that we'll make. Um, so we're just moving forward, staying positive and, and kind of, you know, it is, it is heartbreaking, but we're looking to the excitement of like, which varieties can we plant? Uh, what's going to be best suited for this, for this place? Yeah, I like it. When we first took over the property. We had this, you know, it's a magical dream of taking an old, an old vineyard and rehabilitating it. And you certainly mourn, mourn the loss of the vines at first, but just like Jamie said, once you, understand what it is that's happening. It, it's not rehabilitating, now it's making it ours. It's, it's whatever we want it to be now, whatever varieties we want to plant, however we want to do it. So um, it's exciting. Yeah. yeah, it is exciting. Talk about, um, so we have someone who's um, on the um, 
feed right now, um, Michael, uh, who uh, he is the wine entrepreneur. I hope I'm saying that okay. <laughs> um, but he has been doing wines in New Mexico, and I am coveting hopefully a release of his wine that'll be coming out that he has made with Mission Grapes. It's a rosé. Awesome. Yeah, right? Well, I noticed his comments. We'll have to look at um, his winery. That's super exciting. Yeah. So I don't know if he'll have a winery, but he does have label a label that's out and he's moving to Texas. So sorry, he's not going in your direction, but we're going to get him. <laughs> um, but I think this is interesting because we're talking about, you know, with, when you mentioned, uh, when I mentioned mission or you guys mentioning hybrids um, because of the cold hardiness of them. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think people are, you know, like yourselves are like, let's not be afraid of putting a wine or a blend uh, out there that's using grapes that maybe people may not recognize, right? Like Riesling, recognizable, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, rec Pinot Noir recognizable, but maybe not so much Marquette. How, how do you get beyond that? And how do you just say, look, we just want to make good wine? I think both of us have, I'll say mine and then I'll get a, like a shot of our bottle. It goes back to education. It goes back to being so confident in the quality that you're making or you're so convinced that this grape is so suited for this area. And if you can make quality wine based upon this, you know, cold hardy hybrid variety, put it on the label. Mm -hmm. um, it's only going to, um, you know, you're only going to increase its popularity, increase that recognizability if you put it on the label. Yeah. So you can take your out, you know, so you can put his take on it, but I'll show you the bottle that we had, but it just goes to education. It's that moment where you as a psalm, or you as a, you know, a tasting room manager or winemaker, it goes to just talking and educating the guests, so. Yeah. It's a loaded question, you know? It's, it's, <laughs> I, it's right up there with, the, you know, the questions that get asked to us like uh, <laughs> orange wine or natural wine, or those are the kinds of questions where you're like, oh, I'm scared to go down that path if I'm ready to start answering those kinds yeah. of things. But um, it's, it's all loaded. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the hybrid grape varieties I've tried wines from and personally don't care for, but some we've been blown away by, you know, yeah. I don't, the, sh the slow shifting of, of a country's palate to appreciate new things. It's, it's, a it takes time. It's a process. Yeah. 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 It's the same always, but there are certainly great varieties out there that are hybrids that yeah. are, are doing amazing things. The very first, West Elks wine we ever bought was from one of our um, local wineries here, made a Chambersin. And uh, when we first moved out here, yeah. um, we went to this charity event and it was the first time we'd ever really done a big tasting of the local wines here. And he had a case of back vintage Chambersin for sale and we smelled it and we're like, oh my God, this is, it's like smells like burgundy. <laughs> burgundy. It's like, it smells like burgundy. <laughs> yeah. And I can't yeah. believe my, uh, this wine came from this valley. So a lot of case those, of that. they do <laughs> have a future. They yeah. Do. So you can see like on our label right here, we placed it, you know, Rosé of St. Vincent. Yes. Uh, and then people are like, they think it's a proprietary name. Like, oh, who's St. Vincent? Or is that named after the singer or uh, the poet? Um, we're like, that's the grave. And then it's an educational moment where you can say it's parentage of thought to be Chamberson and Pinot Noir. Um, and, and we find that it makes a great Rosé. We want to experiment with something bubbly from it. So I think it just takes experimentation. And I think it'll take time to kind of shift a palette, but that you can make quality wines from these interesting and suitable obscure right. But we love Vitis Vinifera too. <laughs> yeah, of course. Oh, you don't have to give up on one or the other. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> do both. The other, right. <laughs> um, so tell me um, what you guys have been doing during this time of COVID, right? That, uh, there's obviously been probably some shift in your general plans uh, uh, in, you know, in terms of what you can do with the with guests and things like that like did y'all do anything that you didn't think or that wasn't necessarily on the plans um for this year that you just were like we might as well do this now because we can't do anything else or anything like that this year puppy, <laughs> <laughs> we're, not puppy. Yeah, we got a puppy. we're like okay we're not gonna be traveling around the state as much um and it, it, it's been a it's been a blessing it's kept us home more uh our, i mean right outside so we're in our winery right now right outside is our tasting room uh, we were going to break ground on uh, a larger winery a tasting room but because of covid that was like right mid-march um within a week it was all taken away from us and it's probably a good thing um we, we adapted so we we have a small tasting like a sales room yeah. 
as about 10 by 12 feet, not COVID safe. And so we expanded our outdoor area. We have umbrellas, we have picnic tables, um, and it's called Sunshine Mesa where we live. And uh, we, we only have like, I think two days where it was cloudy and rainy this summer. And we had ordered those umbrellas back in late May and they just showed up like about two weeks ago. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we were just like, bring hats, bring hats when you come out here. Bring but uh, umbrella. I bring an, <laughs> yes, bring your own umbrella. But it's been great. We've seen actually record numbers of people, specifically within the state, a lot of people from Texas and the surrounding Southwest states kind of venturing out. It's been wonderful. Um, our, our sales have actually been higher uh, than, than we projected. So it's great. Um, and, you know, for us to remain open, the way that our state classifies a tasting room, we're actually seen as a bar, even though we're nowhere near a bar. Um, we have to have food. So we don't have a restaurant, we don't have a commercial kitchen. And so we've partnered with a local chef um, and he curates like, Colorado centric charcuterie boards, brings them over each weekend and been able to keep us in business. And we've also chosen, we've done a lot of wine dinners. Like our first year we did multiple wine dinners around the state um, in our vineyard. And we really wanted to keep that going. And so we were actually able to conduct them outside or at a larger venue. Um, cap the audience, but still remain relevant and, and give people that, you know, all those moments where that, that sense of hospitality, the connection with food and wine happen. So yeah. it's been, a, but, it's been hard to execute. It's a lot of things to make sure that you're in compliance, but it's been a lot of fun to, yeah. Yeah. Keep the doors open. And and you got them. <laughs> we certainly amped our production up for the 2020 vintage by about 50%. So it's, kept us busy over the last month. So mm -hmm. I think we'll be closing in on about 2000 cases for the 2020 vintage, which is great. Yeah. We're keeping our vision ahead and expanding our production and not letting this year hamper us. Um, we've seen an increase in our online sales and wine club too. And just really focusing strongly on those. I love that. Yeah. So I guess probably my last question, because I don't want to be, keep you guys too much longer. I know you've got grapes waiting for you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, but you know, we've talked a lot about you guys, which was the, the whole point, but I also want to kind of expand to other, um, other producers in Colorado. I mean, you guys obviously chose and transitioning, um, from, you know, the, the, the restaurant floor, if you will, into saying, we want to stake our claim here in Colorado. You could have gone a lot of places to try to do that. How um, have other producers and who have other producers been that have kind of given you that confidence that, yeah, this, this can be done and they have either hopefully collaborated, not collaborated, but like kind of been mentors or just people to help kind of, um, who would you say has like solidified that, you know, Colorado wine industry is real and legit and has a future? There are different sides of that spectrum. Yeah. There are, there are a couple larger scale wineries that are, making a big push at making some really serious wines, places like Cole Terrace. Yes. Um, yeah. Hard to not talk about Cole Terrace. They're pretty focused on Bordeaux varieties mm -hmm. right now and are doing a solid job. Serious they are job. working really hard to make some serious and wines. And they're innovative using those same quality wines, putting them in canned format. Um, so they're very diverse with what they offer. Um, you know, yeah. other big producers, places like Carlson, just mm -hmm. transitioned owners. Um, the new owners are uh, have a lot of vision for that project. I know that, that that Carlson has a long history of making certain styles of wine, and I know they will continue to make those. But I know the new owners want to um, transition and try a bunch of new exciting projects, which I've been watching their IG feed. And it looks like they're already doing it this year, which is exciting. Okay. But then there's a bunch of smaller, new smaller producers too. Yeah. I mean, for us, the wine that brought us out here was the 2015 Dry Gavirsch Demeanor from Stone Cottage Cellars, which you highlighted in your book. Um, it was absolutely compelling. Um, their Dry Gavirsch Demeanor in, in, you know, uh, in later vintages, like when they got a 91 point score, um, and they just consistently make quality wines. They, I would say, are our mentors. They've paved the way, Brent and Karen Hellickson. Um, you know, just, they've been doing it for 25 years. And so if that hadn't been done and we decided to jump in 20 years ago, we would, we would not be where we are. So we are so uh, grateful, uh, supportive, and appreciative for their support of all the wineries that uh, continue to keep pushing forward. So, and then Carboy Winery, um, yes. 
it's our urban winery. So uh, they have like three, four, I think four locations around the state right now. And it's a tight community. Uh, we, are, we are so fortunate that we're all supportive of each other. Um, you need that, especially as a quote unquote emerging wine region. Yeah. yeah, a bunch of new small ones, you know, things like Buckle, Gunnison, yep. um, Sutcliffe down in Cortez, yeah. um, Sauvage Spectrum, new winery over in Palisades, doing mm -hmm. some great things, Evolve. Yeah, um, and then another like, crazy couple, uh, when I say crazy, I just yeah. like, I know. One, one, <laughs> Mesa Park. Mesa Park. <laughs> uh, they were, it's a husband and wife team, and they were um, like, whatever, fix and flip and realtors before they took on this winemaking gig um and so they have you know war stories to share with us too so but they're a small up and coming winery too so i, I love keep, it yeah, yeah we could keep listing off names here no that's great i think you know in writing this book that was one of the things that became a challenge is i'm like okay we've got you know a snapshot of what's happening right now but as soon as it's published it'll already be out of date right like there's just, these these states are moving quickly and that's exciting so um I apologize in advance to anyone that is not currently in the book, but I know there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of promise. So I hope that um, at least in what is covered, it's giving a good picture of where things can go. Yes. Um, yeah. So, um, well, I want to thank you guys so much for joining me and for sending me some wine. This Riesling is, is super exciting and I'm going to try the other ones uh, this weekend. Um, and so if people, um, want to check out your wines can they get them online where should they go to get them yes um it's our website is super easy to navigate it's just stormsellerwine.com and we ship to about 40 states now and it's basically the two of us and our, our one employee keelan who's outside i think pressure washing lugs right now uh one of us will personally you know wrap up your order and we'd be happy to chat um we've had people call in and say like hey i'm making this dish what wine should I get? And oh, yeah. it's that point where we'll say, you should absolutely try this off dry Riesling if you're gonna make that spicy noodle bowl. So it's very hands-on. That's super cool, I love that. You should walk outside. Last yeah. moment, you want to see oh yeah, you walk are. outside. Also, what's the puppy's name? <laughs> Captain Murphy. Captain Murphy. <laughs> I love it. We also got a COVID puppy. So I think it's just, it's that's what people are doing right now. Um, yeah. So, well, great. I would love to see this. Let's show everyone kind of how beautiful it is out so here. So this is the press. We've got grapes queued up, ready to pick. Um, but this is where you are. Amazing. Now, is that Lamborn? What is that peak? Is that the Lamborn peak or? And then over here is Lamborn peak. It's about 12,500 feet. Above okay. okay. Man, I'm so jealous. Grapes that we're pressing. Um, they are considerably smaller than last year's class because of frost events that killed those large buds. Again, you just, okay. you know, different vintage aspects. I think yeah, that is just what you got to do. Are we losing reception? We're a little far away from our Wi-Fi. A little bit. But that's okay. We still got to see. That's awesome. I love it. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks yeah. so much for Thank you guys so much. I um, look forward to coming out and visiting again and spending some time under your umbrellas. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um, in the meantime, thank you everyone for joining. And hopefully if you want to read a little bit more about the wines of the Southwest, you can go to jessicadupuy.com and uh, visit my little shopping button and I can send you a signed copy of the books, uh, The Wines of Southwest USA. And I hope you go and check out Storm Cellar Wines because um, they are making some pretty special things. So thank you guys so much and happy harvest or happy end of harvest. Enjoy those wines. <laughs> We're ready to dive into your book and uh, find some new to us wineries. Excellent. Well, thank you guys so much and I hope to talk to you soon. Definitely. All right, cheers. All right, bye. <laughs>